Greetings, everyone. Rob Chastner here, continuing in our study of the Gospel of Matthew. And if you're following along, we're in Ma uh, Matthew chapter 21, and we'll begin in verse 18. Now, you remember that chapter 21 begins with the triumphal entry of the Messiah into Jerusalem. He is now within four days of his death. He's traveled with a vast number of people from the region of Galilee into the city of Jerusalem. And understand that Jerusalem normally had a population of 100,000 plus people uh, during the first century. And on one of these free, uh, feast pilgrimages, the population would explode to over 2 million people. And so you'd have a, a large, large caravans of people coming into Jerusalem from every direction around the Roman Empire in order uh, to celebrate the festival, in this case, Passover. Many of these people are traveling alongside of Jesus. Many of them have been healed by Jesus. And for the first time, Jesus has allowed his followers to publicly acknowledge who he is as the promised Messiah, the son of David. There are thousands of people in front of him, thousands of people behind him, all of whom are singing praises and acknowledging that he is the promised Messiah. And as these people are flooding into the streets of Jerusalem, we need to understand that the leadership of Israel had a very low uh, viewpoint of who the common ordinary guy was. The power brokers in Jerusalem would have a view of an ordinary guy from Galilee in the same way that the power brokers today and in Washington, D.C. might have of the Tea Party members. Uh, they were viewed as hillbillies or mountain people or rednecks, and they were viewed as someone who had no ability to make any kind of authoritative decision on spiritual matters. In other words, they are not to be trusted with the reins of power. And so the leadership is viewing this large group of people waltzing into Jerusalem with Jesus as a bunch of rednecks and hillbillies. And these people are acknowledging Jesus as the promised Messiah. As Jesus came into the temple, remember uh, that the high priest had taken over uh, 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 by the family of Annas or Anis. Uh, Josephus, the historian, tells us that this Annas, uh, uh, Anis, uh, pro uh, provided uh, approved, uh, sorry, to be the most fortunate man uh, who had five sons to, uh, who performed the office of the high priest to, uh, to God, and he enjoyed himself with that dignity for a long time formally, which, which had never happened uh, to any of our high priests. Uh, that's an end of a quote now from Josephus. And so this was something that had never happened before in Israel. Uh, you have uh, Anis, uh, who became the high priest, and uh, it was a political appointment, not uh, a spiritual appointment. The king of Syria uh, appointed him and said, you're going to be high priest. Now, he had four sons, one son-in-law and one grandson, all of whom became high priests during a, a six-decade period. And so this family had control of all the business going on in the, in the temple for, for six decades. Uh, and they became fabulously wealthy. And you remember in our last study, um, the report, uh, uh, it was reported by Caiaphas, that Caiaphas, the very man who Jesus uh, came before in a trial, who was the son-in-law of Anis, uh, the... the uh, he had an annual income of uh, a little over $3 million. Uh, that's back in the first century. And so now Jesus comes out into town. The high priests took over the outer court of the temple. This is an area the size of a few football fields long and a few football fields wide. Uh, it's where the pagans, the unbelievers, the Gentiles could come in. Uh, the entire world was invited to come in and pray meditate uh, on spiritual things and and uh, to to see if they can have a spiritual experience with the true living God. Jesus said 
uh, to the religious leaders. This is a, a house of prayer. It's not to be a place of profit. <coughs> and what had happened is the family of Venice turned this Gentile court into a marketplace. And we know that there was a time and a place. Uh, there is a time and a place to make money. And there's a time and a place for prayer, worship and meditation on the things of God. So you, you, you're you not to mix uh, business um, uh, with making a profit. And so, uh, at least not in the same, in the same uh, time, in the same place. Um, so those uh, worshipers would be, would be greatly offended with um, commercial kinds of activity in a house of prayer. And so Christ comes into a place that's supposed to be a place of prayer, and they have turned it into a place of retail. And so Jesus chases them all out. He, out, he turns over the money changers' tables, and he creates, uh, creates an incredible ruckus. Now imagine, you know, if you, uh, uh, you had a crime family uh, uh, open an underground casino in your hometown, in your neighborhood, and the police were on the take, everyone was turning a blind eye, and they were introducing all kinds of criminal elements into community like prostitution and drugs and so forth. Nobody is doing anything about it. So you decide, I've had enough. I'm tired of this, uh, of them disre disrupting the reputation of this fine family neighborhood of ours. And so you take a whip like Jesus did, and you go down into casino and you whip the dealers out of the building. You turn over all the roulette tables and the slot machines. Well, what's going to happen to you? Uh, you're probably going to be fitted with a with cement shoes and 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 thrown into the deepest river or lake that's nearby. A crime family uh, has now taken over uh, the temple, and Jesus is not going to end up with his feet in a barrel of cement, but rather he's going to have his feet nailed to the cross. And you remember, after this happens, he puts on a great a healing session after he turns over the temple uh, money changers. He's healing thousands of people. Then he leaves Jerusalem to go to the town of Bethany to stay uh, for the night at the family compound of his friend Lazarus. Uh, and remember, we said that he never stays in Jerusalem overnight. Now, Jesus is coming back the next day into Jerusalem, and we pick up our study there in verse 18. All right, so when I, uh, uh, the verses are going to be in the little box below the video. You can press pause now and read verse 18 and then come back. All right, early in the morning. Um, so Jesus, uh, Jesus was 100% God and he was 100% man. And being so, you know, he wasn't a ghost. He was hungry. All right, read verses 19 through 20, press the pause button, and then come back. What is this lesson teaching us? Is it teaching us that Jesus must have woken up on the wrong side of the bed? Uh, or, you know, that you don't want to mess around with Jesus when his blood sugar is low? No, that's not what's going on here. You, 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 you cannot really separate this fig tree event from the events which took place in our study previously. There are several passages in the Old Testament where God refers to Israel as a fig tree. Example, in Hosea chapter 9 and verse 10, it says, I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit of the fig tree in the first uh, season or in the first fruits. So what was the fig tree doing? The fig tree was giving off the impression that it can meet your needs. You're hungry. You see a fig tree as you're walking down the way. Uh, you, uh, as an observer, you look at the tree. You say, oh, I can fit my needs here. I'm hungry. I can go there and have breakfast. You get to the tree and you realize that it's all leaves and no fruit. It's all show but no go. Well, what was the religion or the religious activities of the Jews in the temple here in this first century? What had it become? It had become an empty husk of what is it used to be. Uh, there was no real experience ha being had 
by the people with God. There was only formality. There was ritual. There was stained glass. There was incense. And there was no real heart connection between the worshiper and God. And so the fig tree of religion, uh, of Judaism, was putting off this false impression. We know God and we really uh, are relating to God. That was the false impression. Yet meanwhile, what Jesus is saying, there is death here. You are not, you do not know God. You are not relating to God. You are not properly representing God. As Jesus curses the fig tree, he is going to curse Israel as well. And destruction is going to be uh, coming upon them. So not only can this happen in ancient Israel, this can also happen to any church. And it can happen to any individual believer. Uh, for example, you remember what Jesus said to, uh, to the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. Um, it says, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil. You have tested those who have called those, themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. You also possess endurance and have tolerated many things because of my name and have not grown weary. Here's the part. But, in verse 4, I have this against you. You have abandoned the love uh, that you first had. And so if we were alive during this time during the church of Ephesus in their heyday, we would see uh, this is a great church and I could easily get used to being into that church. It is filled with activity. It's filled with excitement. And yet God's view was very different than the people's view. God's view was this is a lot of activity and a lot of excitement. And yet there's no heart conversion or connection between the congregants and God. And so Jesus curses this fig tree. And apparently this was an instantaneous diminishing of life in this tree. So much so that the disciple says, get a load of this. The tree is withering away. Then Jesus answers the disciples. All right, so now you want to press pause, read verses 21 and 22, and then come back. All right, the mountain reference here is the Mount of Olives, which is where they were standing during this event. Now, these, ver uh, these verses, along with companion verses in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 25, are favorite verses for some of the extreme faith groups in the church today. They suggest that the believer who is truly walking by faith should always have plenty of money, and should always have perfect health. Because Jesus clearly says there are that there that whatever you ask believing, it is going to be yours. And so therefore, if you're experiencing sickness, or if you're experiencing some degree of poverty, then the, the sole reason for that sickness or poverty uh, is that you're lacking faith in your life. Now understand, that kind of doctrine is stupid. And, and the reason it's stupid is because you can look in at the last 2,000 plus years of the church history, great men, great women of faith have come and they've gone and they have all died from that which, uh, which had made them sick. Uh, and it did not matter how much faith that they had. You know, are we to believe that our brothers and sisters who suffer, uh, uh, who are suffering in, in, in unbelievable ways in China and India and Sri Lanka and the Northern Pacific or the Pacific Rim uh, are suffering for their faith? Are we saying that the reason why they're suffering is because they are carnal and that they just are not believing on God? Every one of us is going to die. Our bodies are not getting stronger, but rather our bodies are getting weaker. And no matter how much faith you have, we are all under that curse. We will all die. Now, if we had believers who lived to be a thousand years old and they were multiple billionaires, uh, you know, I might go back and, and look at that, uh, that uh, theology and doctrine again, but that hasn't happened in 2,000 plus years. 
uh, we're all under this same curse that we inherited from Adam. We grow to a certain age and we die. The curse has not yet been lifted and it will not be lifted until the kingdom of heaven on earth arrives in our midst. Notice very carefully, this is not a promise which is given to the general public. Verse 22, if you read it again, who is Jesus talking to in this verse? He's talking to the disciples. What is Jesus' definition of a disciple? A disciple is one who denies himself, takes up his cross daily, and now he's following the Lord. And if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you have this power of prayer. This is a promise made to you, a disciple of Jesus. So how can a TV preacher claim that he has taken up the cross daily, claiming the Lord Jesus Christ, while at the same time, he is claiming the beachfront property and the second and third Rolls Royce and the, the second and third uh, Learjet. Uh, is not this health and wealth doctrine a spiritual veneer that we're putting over the, our own carnal lusts and des desires? Jesus is making the, this promise <coughs> to men and women who are going to hazard their own lives for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not likely to be a literal mountain. We have no documented cases in the history of the church where people were speaking to mountains and then those mountains were removed. Perhaps he might be talking about a literal mountain in the sense that a great promise is made to Israel, which we find in Zechariah chapter 14, in the first four verses, which say a day of the Lord is coming when you your plunder will be divided in your presence. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem for battle. The city will be captured, the houses looted and the women raped. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be removed from the city. Uh, then the Lord will go out to fight against those people as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. The Mountain of Olives will be split in half from east to west, forming a huge valley, so that half the mountain will move to the north and half will move to the south. All right, and so here the Messiah is, he, he's talking about mountains being moved. Maybe their minds flashed on this promise by Zechariah. Jesus now makes... Uh, makes his way into the city of Jerusalem. So you want to press pause and read verse 23 and then come back. Jesus is supposed to be Israel's king and he's supposed to be attacking the Romans. He's not attacking the Romans. Who is he attacking? He's attacking the Jewish religious leaders. And these religious leaders interrupt the master's Bible study. This must have been an incredible Bible study because Luke tells us in chapter 19, uh, verses uh, 47 and 8, uh, which says, Every day he was teaching in the temple complex. The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people were looking for a way to destroy him, but they could not find a way to do it because all the people, this is the part of the reference to Luke here, all the people were captivated by what they heard. So the word captivated there, uh, some of your Bibles might say tentative. Uh, the word has the meaning of hanging on or hanging on to every word. It has the idea of giving your full attention or you know, sitting at the edge of your seat. And so here we have this master, the master Jesus. He's in the temple court. There are thousands and thousands of people holding on to every word that he's teaching. And then these guys, these religious leaders, these uh, spiritual Nazis, uh, they, they, that want to make sure that Jesus has the proper paperwork. Let's see your papers, please, is what they're essentially saying to him. Jesus was a man of authority. You remember that the end of the Sermon on the Mount, so that would be in Matthew, the sermons, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So in Matthew chapter 7, it says the people were amazed that he spoke with such authority. 
when you listen to Jesus teach, you knew that he was uh, the connection or a connection or the connection to God or with God. And all throughout the four Gospels, we see many examples of Jesus's authority. In Matthew chapter 9, we're told that Jesus had authority to heal. Uh, he also had authority to forgive sins. In Mark chapter 1, the people were astonished that Jesus had authority over demonic, uh, the demonic world. And you remember why they were uh, astonished. A person, you know, the rabbis, uh, the priests believe that you could only, they could only help release a demon from someone who could speak so that they could tell the, the priests who, what the name of the, the demon was. Well, this guy that he healed, that Jesus healed, couldn't speak. He was mute. And so he healed him anyway. Jesus doesn't need to know someone's name. He just said, get out of here. And with his authority, the demon left. Um, so Jesus had authority over, uh, to heal. He had authority to forgive. He had authority over demons. Uh, in Matthew chapter 28, which we'll study in a few, uh, you know, a few lessons later, uh, in, in, in verse 18, it says, Then Jesus came near, and they said, All, and then he said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So, this authority that Jesus has is the same authority which Jesus gives to us. In John chapter 1, we're told, But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. This doctrine go, that goes around the church circles today, uh, where you do not know if you're saved until after you die, again, that doctrine is dumb. Uh, you know, you, you know, what a crazy time to find out if you're saved or not when you can't do anything about it. So, what do you do with this with this verse? If if I will believe on, all right, not in an historic Jesus, but if I believe on Jesus, if I am trusting in Jesus Christ, then he and he alone will, will get me into everlasting life. He and, he and he alone will get me into the kingdom of God. He gives me the authorization to call myself a child of God. Uh, you can know you can have the knowledge that you are saved, and if you will trust on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will receive that authorization to designate yourself as belonging to God. So these religious leaders, they come up, they interrupt Jesus in his Bible teaching, and they are demanding to see his authorization papers. Now today, you know, if you want to be an ordained minister of the Gospels, you can receive as many ordinations and documents and certificates as there are institutions in the world. You can literally get ordained by a thousand different uh, 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 institutions around the world in this culture. Back in the first century where Jesus was ministering, there was only one body to authorize you to speak on behalf of God and to act upon uh, on behalf of God, and that was the Sanhedrin. The 70 guys who ruled Israel, and so the Sanhedrin's representatives are now interrupting Jesus in this Bible study and demanding, we want to see who authorized you. Where are your papers? Now Jesus answers. All right, so again, you want to press pause and read verses 24 through 26, 24 to 26, and then come back. All right. Was John the baptizer's ministry of heaven or of man? In other words, did John get deputized by heaven? Or was this something that John just came up with on his own? Uh, where it says they began to argue among themselves. It has the idea that they turned their backs on Jesus and they went into a huddle of some sort to discuss Jesus's question. Now remember that there was a large number of the Sanhedrin in this crowd. Uh, they had the leader of the Sanhedrin. They had the weekly course of the priests. That was 24 priests. And then they had the daily course of priests, which was 156. So you can see they had, they had a large number of people. Remember, this is Passover. So all hands on deck, so to speak. Every priest and member of the Sanhedrin 
were working during this festival. And so there were hundreds of guys. No doubt they had hundreds uh, approaching Jesus in a crowd to intimidate him. They all turned their collective backs on Jesus to deliberate. And the verse there tells us that when they were deliberating, if we, we say, they're, they're saying, if we say John's ministry was from heaven, then he's going to say, well, why didn't you believe him? Uh, if they say that John's ministry was from his own head or from man, then we fear that the people will hold John to be a prophet. And so we can, you know, you can see the dilemma that Jesus has put these guys into a corner here. Uh, what, what has John the baptizer gone on record to say? Uh, John the baptizer said, Jesus is the Messiah. Whatever you guys answer, uh, you're going to be trapped uh, because of your own dishonor. And with the millions of pilgrims visiting, they did not want to cause a riot. And so now Jesus answers him, uh, these guys, in verses 27 and 28. So you want to press pause and read verses 27 and 28 and then come back. And so Jesus is being fair with these guys. You can't answer me, so I'm not going to answer your question. Understand that Jesus is done with these guys. They're a bunch of hypocrites. We tend to think that God is long-suffering and that he's just going to love me off into eternity. Yet we can see there is a point uh, where God will draw the line in the sand and he says, uh, he goes from loving you to being your enemy. We don't know what that line is, but if a person continues to reject God, God's response is, I'm done here. God does not beg. God does not argue. There is a point of your reject, uh, rejection to God where God is finished with you. And that was the case here for the religious leaders. Isaiah chapter 63 says, but they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, so he became their enemy and fought against them. There is a point where Jesus will no longer pursue those who rebel against God. And after that happens, you can no longer come to God because God has made the decision, this is a done deal. That is why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. If there is an inkling in your heart to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to go ahead and take care of that inkling right now because the day might come when God draws the line in the sand for your rebellion. From now on, Christ is not arguing with these guys. He's not pleading with these guys, nor is he begging with these guys. Uh, uh, it is just confrontation from this point forward, when Jesus stands before Caiaphas, a guy making three million a year in the first century, Caiaphas desperately needs God. He needs Jesus to save him. And Caiaphas asks Jesus, who are you? Jesus does not say a word. Here is Jesus, the one who holds the words of life for this guy, Caiaphas, the one who can lead this man into paradise. He is confronted by this great sinner, and what does the Lord do? He says nothing. He is finished with Caiaphas. He's finished with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, the, and, and, and all of these, these hypocrites. There's a point of reject, rejecting Jesus that seals a person's fate. The door of the ark is shut, so to speak. No more will be saved, and the destruction is going to come. And, of course, that was the very imagery you get when you read and study the book of Noah. That is where these religious leaders find themselves. All right, we continue now. Uh, if you'll press pause and read verses 28 through 31, 28 to 31, then come back. All right, understand that nobody talked to these religious leaders in such a way. These guys walk down the street. Everyone gets out of their way. Christ is giving them an earful which they had never heard before. And then Jesus uh, responds to them in verse 32. So read verse 32 and then come back. Isn't it interesting that this parable, there are two sons. Notice that both sons are bad. 
to one degree or another. The first son initially gives the dad some grief. Notice that the dad commands son one, go work in the vineyard. There's, uh, there's no debate, it's a command. And notice the rebellion. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. Then he has a change of heart and he goes and he works in the vineyard. Then you've got son number two, is a, he's like a pretender. Okay, pops, I'll go right out to the vineyard and I'll uh, do the work. Yet he never seems to get to the vineyard to do the work that dad commanded. He never carries out uh, the will of the father. Jesus is saying to these two boys uh, that these two boys represent uh, the kind of people before Jesus in the nation of Israel. First, you have the publicans, the tax collectors uh, who sold their soul for money. And then you've got the harlots who sold their bodies for money. And then uh, and they have initially involved uh, themselves in open rebellion. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the claims of God uh, upon them. But they said no and uh, no thank you. I'm going to live my life my way. Then John the baptizer comes along and John begins to preach uh, to them on repentance from sin. There's conviction and the Holy Spirit is obviously drawing these people to John and they enter into a relationship with God. And so they're like the son number one. They're initially rejecting the father, but then they come to their senses through God's grace and then they come to a place of obedience. Then you've got son number two. He's like the pretenders, like the leaders of the temple. They're putting on a show. It's all an act. Yeah, it, it, it's not about God, but rather about money, about power, control, and manipulation. And they're putting off a facade that they're doing the will of the Father or the image that there's everything going well between them and the, and the Father and they're doing what God tells them. Then Jesus comes along and says, no, you're not obeying God. You're not following the law of God. It's all a gimmick. It's all a stage play, uh, which you're putting on here. And so therefore, <clears throat> it is like prostitutes and tax collectors and the thieves. All of the low lives of Jerusalem uh, or the Jewish society who have had a change of heart, who have repented, they have come to God. Notice there is no number three son. In this, in this parable. We would anticipate a third son who would say, yes, dad, uh, and then immediately go, go and do the, uh, the work in the vineyard. There is no third son because a third son doesn't exist in all of humanity. We all have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. What this parable tells us that here today, you are one of three categories. You can you can be in <coughs> you can be in open rebellion against God. There are others who uh, of us who were rebellious, living our own lives, and then through the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were drawn into a relationship with Christ. We have repented, and now we have the right relationship with God. And then the third category is you're just a great pretender who is a member of the church. Uh, or the synagogue, you show up, there's no substance, uh, no real and viable relationship between you and God. You show up at the, the church or synagogue once in a while, you drop some money in the offering plate, you sing a song or two, you pray uh, a prayer or two, but yet there's no connection between you and God. Out of these three categories, there's only one which will live forever in the kingdom of God. I don't need to bring conviction upon you. That's not my job. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. But understand that salvation is not found in religious activity. Salvation is found simply by saying that I am going to believe that because of what Jesus has done, I am going to live forever and I am going to miss the judgment of God. That is how easy salvation is. That is why Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if... You confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You might think that you have a whole lot of living to do before you find religion. The reality is you're not really living, but you're rather 
what you're doing is death. Without a personal relationship with God, your life is diminishing and you're only fooling yourself. It is God and God alone who gives forgiveness. It's God and God alone who gives peace. And it's God and God alone who gives you the joy which you long for in your life. Don't play church. Don't play rebellion. Just be a person who turns to the Lord Jesus. You too will then receive the forgiveness and the grace immediately. And if you are that person who wants to have a relationship with the Lord, simply repeat this prayer. I'll do it nice and slow. You can just repeat it. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and I believe you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and into my life. I want to trust you. I want to follow you as my Lord and as my Savior, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And if you said that prayer today for the first time, please send me an email, uh, send me a note, so I can celebrate with you on Everlasting Life that you've just accepted. Plus, I can send you some supportive material to help you grow in your spiritual walk. Okay, thank you for watching. I hope this has been helpful and informative. Our next study will be Matthew 21, uh, verse, uh, verse 33 through Matthew 22, verse 14. Uh, thank you for viewing and good day.